Please excuse my French, it's a lot worse than my German, or it's on. And then a, uh, a silversmith, is a, was it Bonnie or Feb at that <laughs> Which really is a goldsmith, but it's become common usage to also for a silversmith. Now, I, I'm not just going to talk about silver like you see on the table today. I want to talk about how we got to the point of silver here in uh, our part of the country. And it really was uh, people trying to sell um, Louisiana to the people back in France. And one of the first reports was um, uh, the memoirs of D.R. Quiet. He mentions finding silver in Missouri in, in, in the lead mines of what is now southeast Missouri. And silver does occur naturally in lead, but uh, not to great amounts. And they found that the government officials were saying, well, we got lots of silver over here. So, 1712, uh, Prozac gets a 15-year trade monopoly in the whole uh, part of uh, Upper Louisiana. And he sends uh, Cadillac, and who also founded Detroit, and Mine Lamont, to open up some silver mines in the Illinois country. Well, he doesn't really find silver again, but he, said, he writes back and says, oh, we got lots of silver here. He actually got it from the, the southwest uh, part of, of the, what is now the United States, is from Mexico. But he said he, he had discovered mines of gold and silver. Uh, this is one of the first maps that we have of our area. And it doesn't talk about uh, silver uh, mines or gold mines, but it says right here, the country is full of mines. <laughs> this is 1720, and it says, you can see the salt magazine for the saline on this map already. Uh, you say he's, uh, It also has something about the, I thought it said Mazer, but it didn't. It's Mazer, Missouri, it's the Missouri Indians that you, you see there. Uh, so mining was already becoming important in 1720. Now the thing that really got it going was something called the Mississippi Company. John Law was a Scotsman, and he, he came from a, a family of goldsmiths and silversmiths. But he convinced the French government to open up the, the, uh, the general bank and to issue paper money, which was kind of something new for them. Uh, and in 1717, he formed the Company of the West, which was called, also called the Mississippi Company. It was a, a, a later change to Company Indy, or the, uh, uh, and he was granted a monopoly on the development of all of French Louisiana. And uh, in 1719, Governor Bienville from down in New Orleans writes back that says, oh, they have all this silver that's been found here. So the stock in the company of the Indy just started rising astronomically. And what were the brothers that did the thing on silver here in the States? Uh, yeah, those guys did the same thing, I think. So the stocks just soared, and then it collapsed, and it resulted in a failure of the banking system and some of the public funding in France. It's also called the Mississippi bubble, which burst. Uh, one of the guys that we're kind of familiar with is Philippe Renault. Uh, he came over uh, in 1723, and again, he was to develop the mines uh, in southeast Missouri. Uh, supposedly, he went through what is now Haiti and picked up 200 or 500 uh, African American slaves. And it's said that all the, the uh, slaves in our area were kind of descended from those original 500. Carl Eckford says that's a bunch of bunk because you don't see that many slaves in the uh, census that were taken at that time. So it really probably wasn't 500, it was probably a smaller number, and he also brought over miners and artisans with him. He found some trace elements of gold and silver, but nothing to any extent. He was here for 20 years and finally gave up. There is a little town over in Illinois called Renault. So 
so it was, it was named after him. This is uh, Margaret Brown uh, put this on her uh, little thank you card. It's the symbol of, of a seal that Philip Renault used over, and, and I think it's really a clever looking uh, looking is it seal. Smoking a pipe? Is that what it is? Well, that was very common back then, and, and yeah. Here's a so here we're going. The Mississippi bubbles already burst. And this is the Duprat's map, 1757. And again, you see a salt pit or the saloon. But if you look down here, a gold mine. <laughs> well, now, when you look up here, it says Merrimack Silver Mine. So they're still pushing the fact that we've got silver here, when in fact, our silver was a little heavier and it was called lead. <laughs> One of the things when we're giving tours, we always talk about how there was very little coin in this area and everything was barter. Yeah. One of the things I did is I started looking at, we have a copy of Jockey Board's business journal from 1799. It says who he sold to, what he sold, and how he got paid. And yeah, he did get paid mostly in lead, furs, wheat, corn, sugar. He even saw a pot of lard, a pot of cider. Uh, barge rides across the Mississippi, uh, slave labor, a junior for a day or two uh, by a slave labor, shingles, lumber, and the credit cards of the day, other people's debt. But you, one of the things I also found is we had, there were some French coins of the time period, 1792, the French soul, and the French Uh That's, I think, it's 1793. But I started looking at the transactions, and I wanted did he get paid in silver or whatever? Does silver show up? This is one of the things. Uh, it says received in silver right here. And he got uh, three river first. Also, he received some in lead. So he was getting paid in silver occasionally. We don't know. It doesn't say if it was coin or it was just slivers of silver that they might, might have used. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, I started looking at it. And it says received in gourd. And I thought, gourds? How, how, how is that such a, a, a method of payment? When you look back, that is really the coin of the West Indies. And it really surprised me. In fact, the coin of Haiti is called a gourd to this day. And it really didn't come into official place until 1813. But if you all remember, Jacques Gibord was born in France, went to Saint-Domingue, worked on, a, on a, a plantation down there, escaped during the slave. So he's very familiar with this form of currency. So it's not really gourds. It's, it's, a, it's a coin uh, that it comes from the West Indies. Uh, he pays, paid out the silver at times when, uh, when, when he, when people would bring him stuff, he would pay it back. Uh, Mr. Colin's share here, it says, Donne in orange oil, given in silver, so he a, a one and a half liter. And then Mr. Boulet, down here, uh, <coughs> let's see, I kind of blew it up. It, it means to him, given in silver. So he is, he is actually trading both ways, getting silver as payment, and then getting, uh, giving silver back in, in payment for goods received. And I only found in his whole journal, I only found one item that was identified as a silver item that he sold. Uh, and he sold all kinds of stuff. We talk about uh, the French wearing handkerchiefs on their head, which was. I thought he had six in there. I, I counted them again today. There must have been 12 styles and colors of handkerchiefs. And by the way, the most favorite color was red, which was de Chalet. Yeah. We always thought it was blue because they were mostly Quebec people. No. no. It's red. But he sold to Monsieur de la Suze. It's kind of interesting how he spelled his name, which is different than the way we conventionally spell it. But he sold two dozen knives and parts in silver. It's the only item in that whole uh, journal that's, that's were sold. Were those silver coins Spanish coins? Well, they did have Spanish doubloons here. Yeah. And that's where they would cut them up into quarters. That's how they got to work quarters yeah. and two bits or right. half of a quarter. So that's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I think traditionally we've said that there's not a lot of coin here, but there seemed to be a lot of more. Yeah. 
and people used the coins, they would melt them down and put them in some other farm, typically here, uh, spoons were a common thing, to take their wealth and keep taking out of coins and just put it into things that they could use uh, on a daily basis. I want to talk a little bit now about the, the silversmiths that were here. Uh, probably the most frequent thing they made were spoons. Uh, we see cups, beakers. Uh, I think the difference is one is tapered and one straight. Uh, between the two, uh, ladles, coffee pots, teapots, sugar bowls, creamers, and larger pitchers. And they also, these guys would work on watches, and a lot of times they would put their maker's mark on a watch or on silver or small boxes. And there was also something else called trade silver, and I'm going to talk about that uh, in a little bit. Uh, the first one that we know about that came here was a guy named Louis Cotu. And Louis was born up in uh, Montreal. He came down to what was called Spanish Illinois at the time in the 1780s and first practiced up in St. Louis. We actually have copies of bills that he, where he was selling things and making repairs to watches uh, in St. Louis. But then in the 1792 time period, he went down to Cape, and he was working with Louis Lorimer. And Louis, if you remember, was his wife was, I think, Shawnee, and Louis was very much involved with the Shawnee, so Louis Coulter was going to be making uh, Indian trade silver for, for Louis. But he was only there a couple of years, and uh, he ends up moving to St. Genevieve, and he, and he settles down what is called the Beau Brule, the Burnt Woods area, which is south of uh, St. Mary. Um, the settlements in that time period were St. Genevieve, New Bourbon, Nobel Bourbon, New Bourbon, Beau Brule, which is a subset of, of uh, well, I guess it was the St. Laurent, which is now St. Mary, and then Beau Brule of Burnt Woods. But this is actually a copy of the land grant that he got uh, in the, uh, when, when he moved here to St. Genevieve, and he built a, a cottage there, a uh, wood structure. And when we talk about trade silver, this is what the um, courier de bois that would go out and trade with the Indians for furs, and they would do anything from probably the most famous of the typical ones you see are the Cross of Lorraine. Uh, you have the thing, the gorgets from around your neck, arm bracelets, uh, pins, blanket pins, uh, sort of like this here. Uh, and you can see a variety of other kinds of pins that they would make. And they do this, do this in bulk. Uh, and it, it was a major, major trade item. Uh, we talked a little bit about trademarks, and I wanted to kind of introduce that. Uh, there's two kinds of things that you hear about poisson and cartouche. Um, a poisson is typically used to indicate this, the purity of the silver. Uh, and you'll see various, uh, various ones. Somebody asked how far they go back. 1674 here, they started using them. This is uh, the estate of uh, Madame Gabriel Serrit up in St. Louis in 1796. And it's a whole list of some of the silver. She had a silver mug with a Paris touch mark. Here they're calling it a touch mark rather than a, a fall mark. Uh, she had some boat, uh, sauce boats of silver without a touch mark. But here they're calling the marks Boisseau rather than a cartouche. And it turns out a cartouche is really the kind of the thing that goes around the hallmark, according to a, a, a silver guy in St. Louis. And you'll see different shapes. You see uh, rectangular ones, circular ones. I'm going to show you one that's in the shape of a shield in a minute. But they have some of the European ones get very, very, uh, sometimes it's a, um, like a trapezoid. But it's, they usually would use like a metal punch here to actually stamp that mark in their silver. And there was really, they did two things. One, they identified in a lot of times how much the purity of the silver was. And then the other thing was who made it. In the pieces you see of St. Genevieve silver smiths like Potu, it, you're not going to, they don't do this, the purity thing, but they do, I do the identification of who it, who it was. Now we had, he's the first guy, and we really don't have a lot of pictures of pieces that he made. There's a guy in St. Louis who has collected silver for years, and he's kind of a local expert on mid-Mississippi Valley uh, silver. He believes that this spoon was made by Couture. And this is the mark here, it's more in a shield, and it's got a C in it. 
spoon, it's on the back of, back of the spoon. They would typically mark the back of the spoon and sometimes there would be initials on the back for the family that they were uh, making the part. And how he kind of came to this co uh, conclusion, here's a 1789 bill uh, in St. Louis, and he signed his name right here, Louis Capoue. And you can see that that C is very ornate. And when you look, at it, that really wasn't a clear picture, but this hallmark is the same thing. So uh, Maurice has decided that that is a uh, Louis Capoue piece of silver. The other day I was giving a talk to the Rotary on national politicians that had St. Genevieve connections and somebody asked me if I was going to talk about their sexual preferences and stuff and I said no, but it's always good in a lecture to throw in sword fighting and sex, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a Louis Coteau, uh, back in those times in 1795, there was a lot of intrigue going on about people trying to overthrow the Spanish government here, the British coming in. So in 1795, the lieutenant governor said, you've got to arrest Louis Coteau and send him to New Orleans, which he did. But then Valley writes this letter, says he's an upstanding citizen and everything. He was down there for a while, and so he got off of it. He came back to St. Genevieve, but that was not the end of his problems. 1796, he gets in bad, in, in sorts of bad sort of way with the parish priest. Father Saint Pierre, whose name was really Heligenstein or something like that. The French called him Saint, Saint Pierre. Well, Louis was living with an English woman, and he wasn't married to her, and they had two kids. And the priest was really upset. If you, in Colonial St. James, there were two powerful people in town, three actually the parish priest, the commandant, and the captain of the militia. Well, the parish priest kept saying, Louis, you've got to come see me after church. I want to talk to you. Louis didn't do it, so he writes him a letter. Louis blows him off again. So the priest writes the commandant, who at that time was Francois Valley Bees, and said, you've got to do something about this. This is really upsetting the community. So Valley writes a letter. And uh, he says that, it, let's see. You have to expel from his house an English woman within 24 hours because their cohabitation is contrary to the good morals, morals and the, to the ordinances of his majesty. Well, Louis doesn't kick her out, but he marries her. And so her name was Joseph Parker, and here is the marriage contract out of the uh, church bulletin where uh, he marries Joseph Parker. So that's the sex thing that you're going to get. <laughs> Frank says I can do better than that. <laughs> uh, the next guy I want to talk about, and I'm only going to talk about him briefly, and that's a guy, a guy named Louis Robitaille. Uh, he was uh, apprenticed in Quebec and came down to Fort Detroit and eventually came to St. Genevieve uh, in the 1790s. Uh, and you can see here's his major's mark is typically LR. And, and when he came down here, he also marked uh, Illinois, Illinois, the Illinois country, because we were still called that, even though the British, Illinois was on the British or the American side of the river. But you can see a ladle and a, a pot that he made. He eventually left here around 1804 and went to Natchez. But that's about all I'm going to tell you about him, other than to show you a couple more pieces. I think this ladles in St. Louis at the Missouri History Museum, and that uh, I think that's a sugar, no, uh, could be a creamer, and that's at the Yale uh, uh, University archives. The reason I'm not going to tell you a lot more about him is that our history conference this year, we're going to have Paul Robitaille, who's a descendant of Louis Robitaille, is going to tell you the whole story of Louis Robitaille. Uh, the next one, and, and the one who's po probably the most prolific of our silversmiths, is a guy named Antoine O'Neill, uh, another Quebec-originated uh, guy who uses baptismal record. And uh, he was born in 1769, and he ends up dying about 1820 here in St. Genevieve. He was buried in Memorial Cemetery, and Father Damon actually wrote in the book that, uh, where he, that he died and was buried in the, the cemetery of the parish. 
still looking for it. Uh, like Louis Robitaille, he kind of came down from Quebec to Fort Detroit. Uh, O'Neill ends up in Vincennes for a number of years. He comes here, and we're not exactly sure, sometime between 1813 and 1817. Uh, and lives in a house down on Merchant Street. And Becky's going to talk a little bit more about the O'Neill House in a minute. But it seemed to be kind of a, a movement of those people coming out of Canada down, and there's various routes that they could come down to, to, to the Illinois country. But uh, we had enough people here that had money and could buy the services of the silversmith. Uh, now, we, again, I, I said we have a lot more examples of Antoine O'Neill's silver work. On the left is a cross that was an Indian trade uh, goods cross, uh, and that's in Ohio, or Ontario, out in Delaware. There's that beautiful cup that's been engraved. This is the Rozier pit, uh, pitcher, which uh, belonged to the Rozier family. I think it was given, was done for the, when, the, when they were married. Constance. Right. Seems like Yale's got a couple of nice pieces that belong to St. Genevieve. Yeah. 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 That was actually offered to the Bolivar House to buy, and they turned it down. Didn't, I, I don't know why they didn't buy it, but yes, they turned it down. Here's a, this is a very unusual piece, these little tongs uh, that was Antoine O'Neill's. You don't see that style of silver work that often. Again, some spoons. Uh, this is a beautiful little pitcher with some beautiful engraving on it. Uh, that is, uh, was uh, Antoine O'Neill's. There is Antoine O'Neill's silver here in St. Denis. This cup is actually out of the museum. And you can see that he, he really stamped it with his cartouche. It's a man and a little rectangle. He did it four times on the bottom of this cup. I think there's probably four or five other pieces, the three or four other pieces that are here in town, privately owned. I think the church has a piece also. And his son, Joseph Francis uh, O'Neill, uh, also did some silversmithing. I don't think we know any, any pieces of his, but uh, there was an 1839 inventory. He got into some money problems, and he had to do an inventory of his, of his assets. And there was a note in there that a few tools for my trade of silversmith. So we know that he was doing a little bit of work uh, as he went on. Uh, this uh, picture on the left is from Diderot's Encyclopedia, uh, which was around 1750. And Diderot published this wonderful book about all the sciences and agriculture and stuff like it. It's got beautiful drawings in it. But these were some of the silversmithing tools that, uh, that uh, might have been around when that these silversmiths would have been using. Now, the Beauvais brothers, what's well, a good St. Genevieve name, but that was, these guys were only didn't practice in St. Genevieve that I can tell, and they're a little bit later, you know. The guys we've been talking about are kind of 1813, 1820. These guys are probably more 1840, 1860. Uh, I think we call it Jemian St. Beauvais, the Beauvais, or, or, uh, the house that uh, we call the Linden House is the Jemian Beauvais House. Well, Jimmy and Beauvais is actually from Montreal, but he ends up marrying a St. Genevieve girl, Ella G. Uh, Abishan. And they end up having quite a few kids, like they did in those days, but four of them became silversmiths and all worked out of St. Louis. But again, here's a, you can see their touch mark. Uh, uh, Rennie and Augustus joined forces for a while, so they were R.A. Beauvais. Beautiful, beautiful little cup and a label that uh, the Beauvais brothers might have which did, did in St. Louis. Another one that we don't know anything about is Charles Junere, and he was a Swiss guy, and there's a, in a, one of the books, Missouri Silver Age, it says in 1819 he came to St. Genevieve and posted this ad, Charles E. General, late of Switzerland, Switzerland, respectfully informs the public he has established himself as St. Genevieve next door to John Scott dwelling, well, he will, will repair watches and clocks at most reasonable prices and expects patronage. John Scott's house is where First Bank is located there on the corner of Second and Market, and it burned on Christmas Eve one year. Uh, John Scott, by the way, is the first U.S. representative from Missouri, uh, and he is buried in our cemetery. 
Uh, he's quite the character. Uh, he once defended the law DNA when they were arrested for being too rowdy. <laughs> and when he was on his deathbed, somebody asked him if he was going to have get religion, and he said, nope, I've served the devil my whole life, and I'm not going to desert him now. <laughs> <laughs> there are no known examples of uh, Jean Marais' uh, work. And then uh, there's a guy that we're not, we're not really sure. His silver shows up quite a bit. And it's kind of like a FJD, but this guy in St. Louis thinks that might be a guy named DDA, Pierre, Jean-Pierre DDA. And there was a DDA, Pierre DDA, that lived here in St. Genevieve, but I've only found one piece of information on him. He was in some court case once. Uh, but it's the style of work and the fact that the, some of the provenance that they've had on some of these pieces from family members, members says, he was a silversmith in this area. And so it's one of those ones that you, we're going to still have to work on. One last story about silver. Uh, Furman Rozier, uh, who was uh, mayor here, he was a lawyer. Uh, he wrote in, uh, I think about 1890, he wrote a history of the Mid-Mississippi Valley. And in that, he tells this story about Louis Bolduc. And uh, Louis Bolduc, he said he was an old merchant and he became very rich. And there was a guy that had come here, Thomas Madden, an Irishman who was a surveyor. And Madden had a little money, so he, took, he bet Mr. Bolduc one day that he had more money than Louis Bolduc. Well, Louis sends a slave down into the basement to get his half bushel of silver, and that was the end of the bet. <laughs> Madden walked away, so. You really saw that. It really, right. You really found that record? In yes. The yeah, it was in Furman Wicks. It may be true, it may not be true. It's, <laughs> one, of, it's one of the legends of St. John. I've never believed that. Uh, various uh, books I suggest, if you, there's a great one that's called uh, uh, Missouri Silver Age by uh, Norman Mack. It's got a lot of the St. Genevieve and, and St. St. Louis silversmiths in there. Uh, the Silversmiths of Old Detroit, I think, Becky, you said you found that online. Uh, which is good because like Louis Robitaille and Antoine O'Neill came through Detroit. Uh, there's one on Indian silversmiths, uh, silver in the fur, uh, fur trade. And I found one, uh, there's a nice bibliography, it's a whole uh, website on just books related to silversmithing. So if you want to look something up. So that's it on, whoops, I forgot to mention. This is uh, one of Becky and I's main contacts, Maurice Midlands in St. Louis. He's been collecting Mid-Mississippi Valley uh, silver for years. Uh, he sells it, he collects it, uh, he appraises it. I think he's looked at this collection many years ago. Uh, but he is always looking for Mississippi-related silver. So if you come across some that you, uh, he'd love to hear from you, because uh, it's, it, I mean, he's truly interested in, in knowing more about what, what uh, happened with our silver here. <laughs> Uh, Al asked me to talk about the history conference that's coming up in late September this year, uh, the last last weekend. Uh, we're going to start with an evening reception at uh, down at the Beckett Revolt House. Uh, Hank Johnson's agreed to open that up. It's one of the uh, five post and ground houses left in the United States. And then Saturday morning, we'll start out at the, well, at the community center, and we'll start off with uh, Paul Robitaille doing his research on, on Louis Robitaille, and I've seen his paper. Uh, Janet Miller's going to follow next on A Tale of Two Stores, and she's going to compare Jockey Board store of 1799-1800 to another one of the time period. Uh, then we have Dr. David McDonald, who's from Illinois State. He is, that's where Carl Eckbert did his work, and, and uh, David is, is con continuing on. He's going to talk about a 1752 a crucial year for St. Henry, Fort Duchard, and Fort Duchesne. Then uh, following him will be a guy from Arkansas, Steve Stan Sanders. And uh, I met, or Saunders, I met him about a year and a half ago. He came into St. Genevieve to do a little research on the DeMunn family. Now, Augusta DeMunn was one of the, uh, we had a couple of duels here. And Augusta DeMunn, uh, well, this was more of a street fight. It was uh, jo uh, John MacArthur and Lewis Lynn against uh, uh, Augusta uh, DeMunn. And he ended up uh, dying in the, in the old brick. 
in this very large cemetery. Well, the DeMunn family is really, after talking with Steve, a wonderful family. The father was a guard to King Louis XVIII. There's a DeMunn Avenue in St. Louis, which was one of the brothers. There's a whole place down in Arkansas that the, another brother went to and founded it in there. So Steve's going to come in and talk about the DeMunn family. Uh, pleased to get Dr. Frank Nickel. Uh, many of you know who he is down at Cape. He started the Center for Regional Studies down at, uh, down at Cape. And he's going to talk about uh, Highway 61, a view of America. He's going to talk about it in the 30s. And 40s. So we're really going to cover a lot of time periods here. Uh, this year I asked Brian Kraft, who's a teacher at St. Jim, a history teacher. He's working on his master's at, at Cape in, in uh, historic preservation and history. And he's going to talk about the early tourism efforts in the 30s uh, for St. Okay. John. <laughs> and then I'm going to finish up with uh, when the drummers came to town. And they came to town five times for conventions. And drummers were traveling salesmen. And this was a kind of a neat organization. We got some neat pictures. That evening, we're going to get to tour uh, from 5 to 6 the, Bulldog, uh, the Bobay Amaro House, another post in the ground house, you know, the state owns. And then on Sunday, we'll get offer a tour of uh, the cemetery of the church. We did that a couple of years ago when it rained, so we're going to redo it. There's sign-up sheets. It's $45. Everything is included for that, and we hope you, you come. So, I'd also like to ask uh, Beck Millinger to step, uh, come up and talk just for a few minutes on what she's doing with the Antoine O'Neill House. Thank you. Um, it's interesting that Bob and I have kind of done different things about Antoine O'Neill, but I'll just give you a little bit of information for those of you who don't know about the O'Neill House. It's next to the, uh, the Presbyterian Church on South Main. The church acquired it in 2006 with the idea that we would renovate the house for uh, usage of the church. And we got a little off track right after we purchased it because we had to buy, I believe it was a roof for the church, I don't know. But anyway, I've been actively involved in the uh, committee to restore this house. And restore is kind of a broad word because the house has been through two major floods, 1993, 1996, and then a fire in 1982. So it's in pretty bad shape, but it is very stable. Um, last year, we were approached by the Jeffress Family Foundation of Wisconsin. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that foundation, but they came to us and said, we want to help you. They gave us a grant of almost $20,000 to a matching grant, their Heartland Zone grant, to conduct a historic structure report, which we did in June of 2013, and we completed that in November. And it was very informational because before we, we knew the building was in poor shape, but they sent a group of experts that came in. They did a structure engineering report. They looked at every piece of that building and they concluded to us that it can be restored. It's in pretty good shape, actually. It isn't going to fall over during June of that in a year, but it has some issues. So um, we completed that in November, and then the Jeffress family again came to us and said, can we give you some more money? And they're helping us now with the renovation project. Um, the structures report concluded that it would be about $300,000 to renovate this building. We're not using the word restore. There are several elements in the house that are still structurally sound enough to uh, adaptively reuse the uh, preservationist term. One is the fireplace, it's the original to the building. We think the building was built about 1817. Um, there is a document in town when Joseph, uh, Antoine's son Joseph lost the building to debt that it says the Menard Ballet people took it over. Uh, it was a new frame house. So they concluded that it was built somewhere around 1817 to 1820. And um, so that fireplace can be renovated we can restore it. And then also when you're in the house, there are beaded beam joists that are on the first floor between the two levels that are still in okay shape. We're gonna have some work done on that. So we are actively involved in um, this matching grant from the Jeffers Foundation. They're gonna give us $100,000 of that, 300 if we can earn our 200,000. So that's what I'm doing. I brought my friend Jill Kenneth here who's been talking with some of you. She is a um, silversmith person. She's the person who has the expertise about silver where I don't. So I'm going to have Jill come up for just a second, but 
We are conducting the capital campaign. Some of you may have gotten the letter. I have some brochures. I'll be happy to pass these out. And they're brochures that tell about the O'Neill Project, the house. And um, I've done a lot of research on Antoine O'Neill. Um, I, I could add an hour's worth to, to Bob's. And so uh, I'll probably be speaking at a later time. But Jill and I are putting together our first major fundraiser will be at the World Heritage Day. Um, Jill's going to come up and tell us what she's going to do during that day because I think it'll be really interesting for you all to come down and see us. We're going to be set up on the porch of the O'Neill House, and Jill's going to do a historic silver smithing demonstration. So I'll let Jill come Great. up and tell you about that. I'll thank you for up. Um, I come to the area from New England. I've been working in the jewelry and silversmith and manufacturing side of the business for the past 30 years of my life. So it was a lot of fun to come into St. Genevieve and, and kind of trip and fall and ask a few too many questions about the O'Neill House, and then now all of a sudden I'm, I'm up with my eyeballs in silver and I'm enjoying every minute of it. Um, Mickey, thank you so very much for allowing me to come and play with your silver. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else enjoyed it as much as I did, but it was wonderful. Um, I am technically a manufacturer. And it's not my silver. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Guardianship of the silver. Yeah. So I am technically a manufacturing silversmith. Um, silversmithing one like uh, in Anton and Neil's day where he was a, a jack of all trades. He did his own casting and he decorated the vessels and he raised the pots and he did his chasing and his polishing. Over the past 200 years, we've all broken out and subspecialized. So technically, I'm a model maker. I make not necessarily teapots all the time, but I make the feet for the teapots, I make the finials, I make the handles, I make tray grips, I make trophy components. But um, come Royal Heritage Days, I'm going to be setting up an old-fashioned silversmithing demo, and when I invite everybody to come on by, what I'm going to be doing is, is straight raising. And in Bob's opening slide, you saw a silversmith working on a sheet of silver. I'm going to be showing how the sheet moves from a flat stage up into a formed vessel. And that will be the technique that O'Neill did to bring up the rosier pitcher that Yale has, as well as some of the beakers and the goblets. Um, so we'll be straight raising, good old hammer and stay, tap, tap, tap. And I also want to invite everybody on out. Um, I'm going to give you all an opportunity to do some hammer work yourselves if anybody wants to step up with the plate and um, see what it'll, uh, uh, it feels like. Uh, it's kind of a day in the life of a silversmith. Um, so that's going to be doing uh, Royal Heritage Days and also the evening before doing the art walk. And we'll be over at the O'Neill House and, and see if we can make a handbell out of silver and then show you all the process of, of how it comes to be. I'd also like to mention that Jill has been very gracious to offer a ton of her expertise, but she has created um, some silver jewelry that's inspired by the worst of Antoine that right. we will be offering exclusively that day for sale, and then we'll sell it after that. And there will, there's also a Christmas ornament uh, based on one of the trade silver crosses. Um, it's in production right now. It should be. It should be absolutely beautiful. I, I've just enjoyed learning about Emil Silver. I, I really admire what I've seen so far. So, so the bracelet will have three charms. One will be that cross, which Bob had a picture of. Um, that cross was actually found in an Indian burial ground. This one in Amherstburg, Windsor, Ontario, in 1891. That's back when you could go through. <laughs> A burial ground. Just take what you want, I guess. Um, but she's going to make a, a reproduction of this, uh, inspired by this, and then there will be a fleur de lis, fleur de lis, and, and a, a low relief of the actual Anton O'Neill house. Uh, so, and on the back, his cartouche's hallmark, um, as, as tribute to O'Neill and what he's done. Um, a lot of good information about O'Neill and his presence in the community and the role of the soldiers in the community is coming out of her involvement with the uh, O'Neill house. One thing I didn't mention when we actually renovate the house, we will be using the cleaning rooms. We have a food pantry. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the food pantry at the Presbyterian Church, but we are open every week. Um, Ed Millinger, my husband, is actually the director of that. And we, we serve about 80 people a month. So one of our goals was always to expand that food pantry. And in the back of the O'Neill will be a new food pantry that will have, uh, will have ADA access. Um, we'll also have a youth center up above where the kids, we have a lot of children from other denominations that join our church for Bible school and that type of thing. So those are some of our goals for that. So it's an astronomical amount of money that we have to raise, but I believe that we can. It's very worthwhile. 
Antoine O'Neill was an artist and a craftsman, probably one of the earliest that we know to build a building that's still standing. So uh, we hope that you will support our project. Many of you have already given us some support and we really appreciate that. You can go on our website, it's um, stgenpresbyterian.com and get updates. I'll be updating the amount of money. There's information there about the Wheels Live, it's silver. Uh, I've kind of made it a project to find out um, of all of the work that's available from for Antoine O'Neill, there isn't a lot really. And I'm collecting images that we will put together for a directory. But there for somebody who we're, we're not sure if he was a bit player, but we know that Indiana considers him their most famous silversmith. He lived in Vincennes. So it kind of tells you he was one of those people that did have a mark in mind. And so um, we really appreciate it if you support us. If you have any questions, you can see me after. I brought some pictures of some of his silver that um, that I know is around. So see me afterwards and we'll, we'll give you more information. Thank you. Channel 7 and 98 TV and web broadcasting are made possible through contributions and donations from viewers like you. Thank you for your support.